Hello, and thank you for joining us for this second part discussion on the election of 2024. In part one, we focused on the presidential choices before us in November. In this discussion, we'd like to concentrate on the other decisions to be made, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and state legislatures that will determine the future of this country in large part. We have three experts again that will help us uh, go through the options. Dr. Basil Smeichel, political strategist, director of the Public Policy Program of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College. And he's also a former executive director of the New York State Democratic Party. Dr. Christina Greer, associate professor at Fordham University, author of Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, and host of the Blackest Questions on the GRIO Black Podcast. And Errol Lewis, host of New York One's Inside City Hall, and the big deal with Errol Lewis that you can catch every Friday. Errol is also an adjunct professor of urban reporting at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism here at CUNY. And thank you all for coming back for part two to continue this discussion. Um, let's take a look at Black America. As you know, the Urban League every year issues its report, The State of Black America, and an interesting you know, sort of dichotomy. Yes, things are better, but in terms of the wealth gap, in terms of income, black American families are farther away from white American families in terms of their security and income and uh, owning of homes and all of that. So in a 20-year in a time period, uh, we've slid back as opposed to moving forward. Errol, do you want to? Sure. The, the State of Black America, the Urban League Report, they, they really focus on the fact that this is the 60th anniversary of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the Magna Carta of, of freedom for, for so many uh, of us. Uh, but they also talk about this dichotomy that uh, in the economic sphere, people are uh, disproportionately harmed by the same uh, housing problems that have bedeviled the whole country, that housing starts are down, um, the, the price of housing has gone up, hedge funds have gone and snapped up individual homes, they've turned many, many communities into communities of renters rather than owners, and of course, uh, the home is traditionally and usually uh, the main store of wealth for most American families. And so to be shut out of the housing market, the inability that many people in their 30s and 40s have, the inability to get the down payment, to secure a loan, uh, to have access to that home ownership, means an intergenerational problem where wealth is not accumulating, uh, wealth is not being passed on. It's a very serious uh, economic problem, not simply confined to black Americans, but certainly something uh, people are going to have to try and develop some strategies to deal with. And, and also just on the pure poverty level, you know, most of the impoverished children in this country are children of color, you know, so that there is not only home ownership and on those high levels, but on the level of hunger and homelessness and no health care. Uh, all of that, um, we know that we have huge problems uh, in this way. But as Christina pointed out in part one, many of us only look to the head of, uh, you know, this system that we have, you know, this is the president, so who's going to be president? And we don't really think about the rest of that system and how that plays. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the Senate because there's a possibility, you know, of uh, adding uh, some black senators to this list, hopefully uh, the possibility of holding on to a, uh, a Senate. What is, Basil, what's your, your thinking about? Of that, are we hold, uh, and I say we, are, <laughs> are the Democrats holding on to the Senate uh, in this election? Well, as among, we have some wonderful candidates. Lisa Bunt Rochester in Delaware, who I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, a couple of weeks ago, has been uh, a tremendous candidate. I'm actually doing an interview uh, with Hill Harper uh, in a couple of weeks, and he's running for Senate in Michigan. So there are wonderful candidates that are, that are out there. Uh, the concern, however, is because there's such a razor-thin Democratic advantage in the Senate, and we look at what states are in play. Ohio, um, yesterday, uh, the Republicans just nominated a pro-Trump uh, uh, candidate to go and up anti against trans uh, and, and LGBTQ to, anti all kinds of stuff. right <laughs> and, anti candidate right right and going up against Shara Brown um, the Democrat that's going to be a really tight race which means that for Democrats the path to victory is going to have to go through uh, Montana 
uh, because in part, um, in addition to Ohio, um, testers running in, in, in Montana, in part because with the mansion uh, retirement resignation uh, West Virginia, in yeah. West Virginia, that will be a Republican seat. Um, so it is, it's, there's, there's not much room for error. Uh, for Democrats to be able to retain uh, retain the Senate. What about Colin Allred in Texas going after Ted Cruz? Uh, that's just that's just always going to be it's Texas. That's just always <laughs> that's just going to be tough no, no matter what. Love great candidate, um, but but it's Texas, tough state. But Christina, do you see Democrats holding on to the Senate or losing it this time? You know, I'm a political scientist, but sometimes I wish I was. You know, everyone's like, you know, you're not Miss Cleo. Um, I, I wish I could predict. It's. It's really difficult, Carol, because we talked about, you know, sort of galvani galvanizing voters and it's too soon to tell. We know as New Yorkers, we can barely break double digits um, for local elections. There's a sense of voter apathy and also voter fatigue. We also need a lot of the Democratic candidates that Basil just laid out. They also have primaries, uh, pretty contentious primaries. Now, I think primaries are a great thing. It helps you articulate your vision. It helps you communicate to voters what you will do if you make it to the Senate. The only drawback of a contentious primary is you and your Democratic opponent sort of stab one another and sometimes give your Republican opponent right. a nice little playbook to follow up with. Uh, we've got some really important states it really does depend on turnout, turnout, turnout in November. If people, usually we talk about the top of the ticket, sort of the presidential right. coattails bringing people in. If people aren't terribly excited about, say, a Joe Biden at the top of the ticket, then that does suppress all these other Democratic Senate candidates. Now, as we've talked about, though, if Donald Trump is essentially shrinking his base, if he's telling people, don't turn out early to vote, we don't need to vote by mail, just come out on election day and things happen on election day, whether it's weather or whatever it may be. That makes it more difficult for Republicans to actually get what they want. And so I hate to sort of give the, the time will tell, but here we are. I will say this just really quickly. Yes. I should have said this at the top of the hour. I'm a Moynihan Public Scholars Fellow at City College. I just didn't want everyone to be uh, associated with CUNY. And I, I also am associated with CUNY this year. So I just need to make sure that I'm a proud City College Moynihan Public Fellow. We're glad it's a clean sweep here. That's, that's Everybody, right. Everybody sitting here is involved in CUNY. Uh, and, and so proud of it. Um, I, I want to ask about black women who were accredited in the last major presidential election of electing Joe Biden and this powerful thing. Higher Heights, you know, the organization that supports black women and does a lot of the research, has a very troubling uh, piece uh, of their new findings in that they feel that they're finding that black women no longer feel as powerful as they did. Uh, and I wonder if you have any insight on that. I mean, because that's a, you know, everything was always placed. Black women did this, you know, you can do it again. And if it doesn't happen, it's your fault. You know, that's the general scenario. Yeah, I, I just wrote an academic piece about black women being keepers of not just the Democratic Party, but democracy writ large. And I'm a proud founding member of Higher Heights. Uh, Glenda Carr and Kimberly Peeler Allen have done a lot. They're supporting Angela Olsel Brooks in Maryland. They're supporting Lisa Blunt Rochester in Delaware. They've done a lot to bring people in. Black women, by and large, r vote roughly 95% of black women vote for the Democratic Party. We are exhausted. Yes, we are the keepers of the Democratic Party and democracy writ large, but there's only but so many of us. We are not the majority in this country. We are articulating the vision. We are the canaries in the mind, warning of the dangers ahead. When we vote, it's usually for an expansive voting. We bring in sort of benefits for others. Now, the second closest group to us is black men, contrary to what, you know, know nothing <laughs> certain celebrities and the Republican Party may say, black men are not running in droves to the Republican Party. That's primarily white men and white women are solid uh, in the Republican Party. And Latinos and Asians are somewhat in the middle more so. In this particular race, it cannot only be incumbent upon black women to turn out and motivate. Others have to do their part. And so I think the work of Higher Heights is saying, you know, there's a certain percentage and there's a certain threshold for what we can do, but other people have to 
put on their pink hats right. and get to work. Mm -hmm. There's a certain, you know, abdication that we hear from a lot of white voters, which will say, oh, I just, I lost my parents to conservative television. Oh, my parents are, you know, Trump supporters. What am I going to do? Well, there's a lot that you can do between March and November 5th to try and erode away and articulate a vision of what does your parents' health care look like? You know, what, is, what does their housing plan look like? You know, what does the future of this country look like for your parents, you know, besides the perception of what they feel, but the reality of their circumstance? It can't just be incumbent upon black women to try and ring the alarm for everyone else. People actually have to put on their own gloves and do the work. Right. So, so you say it's a myth that black men are, uh, are, are trending towards Donald Trump. I, I just want to clear that up right now here. It's, it's not, it's not um, I, <clears throat> myth is maybe... Yes too strong of a word, but um, there's an inaccurate perception, shall we say. Uh, and I, I use my own um, nephews, of which I have many. many. Um, we uh, all have big families, right? As, as, a, as a sounding board. <laughs> and I, I talk to them and I, I hear, you know, the darndest things. Kids say the darndest things. Um, and, and I've had to point out to them, and I think this is probably what's going to happen later in the election season in general. Um, I, I point out to them that um, their perception that they were somehow doing better during the Trump years, because that's what I keep hearing. Yeah. Oh, we were doing better during the Trump years economically. And I said, so the pandemic doesn't mean anything to you or, you know, the, the numbers don't mean anything because I can show you number after number after number. Are you making more now? Yes, I am. Oh, well, but, yeah, but prices are higher. And it's like, okay, well, did the amount that you're making now outpace the inflation? Uh, do you realize that inflation is coming down? Have you looked at the numbers lately? And by the way, there's a whole bunch of other things that come with this. You know, if the person is going to take away your voting rights, take away your health care, uh, you know. Force shut, you to have kids that you may not be ready for. Take away your, your <laughs> right, right. right. Uh, and, you know, and shut you out of the college of your choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are, are you, are you, you know, is that, that extra $2 an hour you think you made a few years ago, you think that's, that's really going to uh, offset it? I think really what happens is, just as in real life, when it comes to voting, you know, people will say a lot of different things. Uh, and we often know from personal experience that the conversation changes when you say, hey, want to bet? You know, want to put some money on the table? You want to, do you really mean this? You know, oh, you think they're all the same, or you think he's too old, or you think this, you think that. Right. Okay, fine. Let's put something at stake here. You know, would you bet $10,000? You know, is, is it worth that much to you? Mm -hmm. you, you? You really think this candidate's going to do so much for you? How much is that worth to you? And, and I, I think, of course, it won't be money, but as we get closer to Election Day, people, I think, if, if the candidates are doing their job properly and the party's doing its job properly, uh, some of this will come home to them. That, you know, like, look, this is, this is what's really at stake this is what you will get if you vote in one direction, and this is very much what you can expect from experience if you vote in that direction. And we actually have, uh, you know, the advantage in this case of having two sequential uh, uh, presidents, so you can actually compare one four-year period to the next four period, and the, the the comparison is not even close. Yeah, Basil, yeah. what are, what mm -hmm. are your what are your thoughts? I want to ask you though about the House. Uh, we know that. Not much has gotten done mm. <clears throat> in the House of Representatives, you know, but one of the things that seems to be, uh, I mean, there, the international issues of um, uh, the border uh, of uh, Israel, the G Gaza, mm. of uh, Michigan, where there was a sizable population who voted uncommitted uh, in the Democratic primary bec over, you know, the treatment of the Palestinians in, uh, in Gaza. Where, uh, where do you come down in terms of that? Well, you know, and because we're at CUNY, I can, I, you know, it's important for me to say this. You know, I have a lot of students that say they don't want to vote uh, this year, um, whether it's because of uh, the Israel-Gaza uh, conflict or they just don't like Joe Biden. Um, but as a, you know, I, I can't be a Democratic evangelist in the classroom. But I always say to the students, your actions have electoral consequences, uh, plain and simple. As a former party leader, we know, I always say, we know when you don't vote because we just, we keep a record of that. We know when you don't vote. And if I know when you don't vote, then everybody else running for office in either party will know that you don't vote. And this is a huge uh, contingent, this young vote yeah. that's been... Uh, tampered with in a way by by this uh, what what they perceive to be uh, the persecution destruction uh, m murder actually of many Palestinians mm -hmm. so 
Well, you know, when I was their age, the issue was apartheid in South Africa. Right. You know, march against that. We marched for financial aid <laughs> support from Cornell, where I went to, where I went to undergrad. So we've, as a, you know, when you're young, you're, you're, you're out there, you're protesting, you're fighting for change, you know, uh, and to quote, to paraphrase Audre Lorde, who's a hunter grad, I might add, <laughs> um, you know, in talking about the activism that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and particularly African-American women in our day-to-day -day lives. And they're, they, they are, they are, a re they are uh, students who have experienced the, the, the Great Recession. They've experienced uh, the COVID. So they're going through a heck of a lot right now and are worried about their future. What, I, what I've said to them is just don't focus on the top of the ticket. There are things that are affecting your day-to-day -day life that you've got to get out there and support and vote for um, because I understand your activism today. But, you know, we, are, we also have to fight for your life tomorrow or once you graduate. And I want them to, 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 to sort of be mindful of that. But I would just add very quickly, yeah. the, the, the conservatives are counting on those folks not coming out to vote. Right. They're counting on splitting African-American men and African-American women by directly talking to African-American men and saying, you want somebody strong that's going to be able to fight for you? Um, that's who I'm going to be. Because I hear that from a lot of African-American men. Trump is strong. He's a fighter. Like, really? Who's he actually fighting for? Uh, because at some point, you think he's fighting for you today, but that white supremacist language is going to be trained to you at some point. Yeah. Now, the, st the state legislatures, for instance, to this point of looking down the ticket, you know, as of March 1st, apparently 54.79 percent of all state legislative seats nationally uh, were belong to Republicans. Mm. Uh, and only 44 percent uh, belong to uh, to Democrats. So already we're looking at when I, I just saw some, you know, alert that came from the Democratic Party that said it's the states. You know, you have to, you know, we've got to focus on that. Whatever happens on abortion is going to happen in the states. Whatever happens, you know, uh, so many of these things. And yet, as we've pointed out here, we're to this party very late. Uh, well, you know, I've had the, the pleasure of spending election night with Errol for <laughs> years now um, and primary night, too, which is always, you know, the, right. I, I love elections. OK. And in New York, we've got plenty. Um, but what we've talked about over the years is that for so many districts, they're calcified either as Republican or Democrat. There are very few districts that are actually swing districts and we see some activity. That's why we're all a flutter when, you know, those districts tend to pop up. So the primary for so many districts is really the election. Once that's decided in June or September, whatever state you live in, um, that's pretty much who's going to the state house. We've been together on election night and we're seeing people win their primary. 3,000 votes, mm -hmm. 4,000 votes, maybe. We've, we were together one night years ago where someone got in on 2,200 votes and we couldn't believe it because we knew that they'd be elected in November. Right. And this is going to be someone who's in charge of environmental issues. Mm -hmm. This is someone who could possibly run for Congress in a little bit. This is someone who's in charge of education, housing, infrastructure. I mean, I, infrastructure again. But all the issues that affect from the moment you wake up to the moment you put your, your head to bed, this is someone who got in with barely 3,000 votes. And so this lack of paying attention, as Basil pointed out, right. They know that you're not paying attention. You know, I ask my students and friends all the time, can you name the president and vice president? Sure, that's easy, you know. Can you name all the cabinet members in D.C.? Okay, many, depending on how they are. But can you name your state senator yeah. right. and your state legislator? You might be able to name your two senators, maybe, but can you name your member of the House? Can you name your city council member? Can you name your district leaders? I mean, these now we're getting into the micro-level right. politics of issues that are directly affecting you and your family and, and tax structures and everything else when it comes to generational wealth or, or lack thereof uh, and public schools, uh, charter schools, how people vote. And it, not, it's not just can you name them, do you know where they stand on these issues? Mm. Exactly. Do you agree with them? Um, and so I think this investment that we all need to do a little bit more of and in investing in 
our own democracy. And it starts with paying attention to who our representatives are. Because we've got about 15 people who are representing us at various levels of government. Yeah. And most people have zero idea That's who right. those individuals That's are. Right. And, and most people don't have uh, the idea either that in this presidential race, there were also so many close, <laughs> uh, you know, votes. At, uh, what was it, 11,000? Uh, I mean, whatever. Very, very close. But uh, they're predicting in... November that there are only six or seven states that will actually make the difference, you know. Mm -hmm. And of those six or seven states, uh, as of today, as we record this, President Biden only leads in one of them. Uh, you know, in Arizona, in Nevada, uh, uh, Biden only leads, leads in Pennsylvania, but in all of the others, Wisconsin, at this reading, uh, uh, former President Trump uh, has the lead in those crucial uh, states. Uh, do, too, so, too soon to panic uh, if you're a Democrat. Do I look like I'm panicking? Well, <laughs> well, I, well there are a lot of people out there on social media in particular, I see it. And then, look, frankly, some of the headline writers and some of the editors making choices at the major yeah. newspapers uh -huh. and, and media outlets are making choices based on this perceived uh, uh, situation. Um, I, you know, look, at this point, and I know Basil knows these kind of things by heart, but at this point, I believe in 1980, Ronald Reagan was like eight points behind, and he came back and won. Uh, at this point in 19, I think, uh, well, it would have been 1988, um, you had a, a huge lead, 20-point lead by Michael Dukakis, who went on to lose the race. Uh, it's, 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 it's early days. It's much too soon. People are, are by and large, not only not paying attention, but even to the extent that they are paying attention, there's not a whole lot of information that's really sort of uh, coming through and helping to form opinions. So, um, we, so we shouldn't worry because I believe the percentage of leading is uh, five or six or seven percent. Uh, Biden has like less than one percent lead in Pennsylvania. That's well, let me well let me be clear. Yeah, yeah. We we should worry, but we should worry not about those numbers. We right. should each of us worry about what we are doing, uh, and mm -hmm. and and stop keeping an eye on the scoreboard and just play the game. Well, can I also say? All states matter in this sense because we can't just cede it to like, oh, well, you know, we, we know the, the sort of swing states that are important. But I should point out that it's because of New York that we don't have unified government as Democrats. It was the four losses in New York State exactly. that changed the composition of the House of Representatives. So we can't just say, okay, well, New York's blue. We, we can move on. You know, like, uh, we don't have to worry about these particular states. Point. It's like every state we've got to fight for it because if we remember Kathy Hochul's gubernatorial race, give Lee Zeldin a few more weeks, we'd be looking at a very different conversation. Precisely. So all states are red states, it's just blue cities in between, as I argue, and it's like, can we galvanize these blue cities to sort of change, uh, change the calculus uh, every presidential election year? And so I, I just, I caution folks who have, you know, relatives in safe states. It's mm -hmm. like, no safest state, because if you look at sort of how California has changed over the years, it used to be a beet red state, and now it's blue. New York, you know, seem, seems blue, but, we didn't, listen, we had 20 years of Republican mayors. It's purple. Yeah. Well, and she's absolutely right. I think the there were 18 congressional seats where Biden won, but uh, are represented by Republicans. Tom Swazi flipped one of those, but there are three others or four others in New York that the DCCC is looking at. So New York, to Christina's point, uh, we don't necessarily play in the presidential race, but we will play in making sure or in getting uh, Hakeem Jeffries to be the first black speaker of the House. Um, it also goes through California and with a handful of other states um, outside of that. So that down ballot becomes incredibly important, particularly for these, for these, uh, for these New York races. Is, is there a reasonable chance that the House can uh, turn blue? I actually, I do think so. Um, look, it's it's not going to be easy. Uh, some of those seats, the, these seats are in the the suburbs and in the Hudson Valley here in New York, um, where you don't have as many African American voters as you would in some other parts of the state. Um, but you know, white voters don't come out either. Um, and so, and we have to understand that it's not just black voters that don't come out. It just so happens that when we don't come out, you know, it will disproportionately negatively impact us. But if the if the Democrats do what they should do. And message appropriately, um, and and really focus on running local campaigns. Sometimes you can nationalize it, but you got to balance that really well. Tom Swazi actually did that in in his uh, special election. So if they can do that, strike that balance, I, I think Democrats have a good shot.
Aaron? Yeah, I, 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 one thing I've noticed is um, both in the State of the Union speech and in general, the Democrats are not doing something that um, they usually do to great effect, which is to focus on the economy. Yeah. Uh, when you see the Republicans pushing and talking about things like immigration, um, talking about almost any, almost any kind of issue other than the economy, that's a signal that the economy's doing well, mm -hmm. they don't think they can take credit for it, and they would rather people not talk about the economy. Uh, so I, I'm waiting and hoping that there'll be more discussion about what has happened. Record high stock market, if you care about that part of the economy. Um, inflation coming down, if you're affected by that part of the economy. Uh, I think a gallon of milk, right? You know, shopping in the supermarket, it's that part of the economy that hasn't budged uh, sufficiently enough that makes people nervous. It's, it's, it's high, but, but, you know, we've also seen this before. In, the, in his re-election campaign in 1996, Bill Clinton, I think, very effectively uh, kept running on the line that, I will fight till the last dog dies. I am here fighting for you. It's not perfect, but I am on your side. That's what works. That's what really has always worked. And in that race, in that 1996 race, since we've been keeping accurate data from the 1950s until then, it's only been two times in recent history that white women have voted for the Democratic presidential candidate, 1964 LBJ, and 1996 mm -hmm. second term Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can think about sort of what made him effective uh, then, um, we might want to go in that path. But I, do, I do think, though, you are very right. There is reality that Errol is talking about. And then perception is real. If people go to the grocery store and they feel like $50 gets me one grocery bag, whereas a few years ago it got me two grocery bags, then something is different. And so there's a way that Democrats have to articulate sort of all the great things that are happening with this thing called the economy and how it actually translates in short term and long term to your actual pocketbook, because that's how voters oftentimes tend to go to the polls. I wish we had another half hour, you know? We'll ha will you come back again? Sure, we'll, absolutely. absolutely. We, will, we will do this again because you all are such, you have such ter terrific perceptions and understanding and history. And it's great to see you in the CUNY studio as opposed to the major networks, you know? <laughs> You've come home. So we want to thank you all so much, uh, Christina Greer, Errol Lewis, and Dr. Basil Smeichel, uh, for these uh, two parts of our discussion on the upcoming election. Uh, we hope you'll watch parts one and part two together, or however you'd like to do it, watch two first and then one. Mm. Uh, they are terrific on, uh, on every single aspect. Uh, and in case you missed the first half of this discussion, be sure to follow us online and on social media. Uh, the program is Black America. Uh, I'm Carol Jengis. We thank you so much for being with us today.